Hey everybody, it's Sister Constancy. So I just want to thank you again for all for tuning in, whether you're at home by yourself or you're in a small group uh, with the Religious Family of the Incarnate Word for uh, our annual Youth Day. Uh, unfortunately, as all of you know, we are not able to meet together in Luxembourg for a weekend, um, getting to see each other again, having time to uh, fellowship with one another and play sports and listen to great talks and really just grow in our Catholic faith together as a community in North Europe. But regardless, uh, the religious family, we decided to put uh, this youth day online for you. And so I just thank you again for listening and um, taking the time to listen to each of these talks and really take advantage of this time, even during the epidemic of trying to deepen your faith and try to always ask the question, what is God calling me to do here and now in my daily life, even in the midst of unexpected uh, adventures that each of us go through. So um, this, uh, this talk today that what I would like to give is actually it's from the same book that I had used last year when I had given a talk and I'm taking it from the book written by one of our priests of the Institute of the Incarnate Word Miguel Fuentes and he wrote a small compact book that is really fantastic um, that explains the maturity of our personality so there's many different topics but he um, speaks about that contain or comprise or make up our personality and last year I had given a talk on the maturity of our intellect and I think maybe I spoke a little bit on the, the maturity of our will and after that there's other um, other topics of maturity in my faith and my religious life there's maturity in my self-image there's maturity in my relationships with other people and so this year I really wanted to like go back into that book and take another chapter what I'd like to present with you today and I'm taking the part on maturity of our self-image so this whole talk hopefully I'll be able to sum it up briefly for you but it's it's generally of how uh, I am viewed by other people and how I want myself to be portrayed or to be viewed or seen by other people so we're going to talk about what does it mean to have a mature self-image and some signs or some ways that we can recognize uh, an immature person who sees themselves and how they portray themselves to other people. So we can just pretty much summarize a mature person is they also have a self-image that we say that is balanced and realistic, meaning they don't exaggerate uh, who they are or they don't imagine um, what they would like to be like and they don't present this way to other people and um, I give a, a really funny example when I was like 11 or 12 I think uh, I had a MySpace if you don't know what a MySpace is that's like the dinosaur or stone age version of Facebook so it was a way like we can put upload uh, vi videos and pictures and um, like write a little bit about yourself, your hobbies, what you like, what you don't like, music artists. I remember I, I grew up near the, the water so I loved being at the beach and, and everything about the beach, whatever it was. And I remember like one of the, the options that you could put on the MySpace of things about the water that you love surfing. And I wrote, yeah, like I love surfing, like all this kind of great stuff. I love things about the water and just writing all this kind of stuff. And I had never even like touched a surfboard in my life. But it's like, it's really funny because the things that you love and the things that you take really great pleasure in, but when you want other people to see you, you don't want to see, they don't want, you don't want them to see you as like a normal, uh, really, um, just like basic average guy but you want to show people like something new and exciting and wow that person's so cool so like you lie and you say i love going surfing and i've never even touched a surfboard before but then you realize that like as you grow on like i'm not really being honest with myself and making this imaginary idea of who i am and who i want like that person to be portrayed by other people so we're going to go off. We're going to go on and see uh, other aspects in our life of how um, those little those things we can correct them or purify them to make sure that we always show exactly who I am really, 
and have a real knowledge of myself and to be comfortable with that. So that way we can actually talk about what is the definition of a mature self-image of oneself. So maturity of self-image is the acceptance of one's personality as a gift from God and the conviction that we should constantly strive and seriously work towards our sanctity. So again, we have to look at the acceptance. That's probably the biggest problem that everybody has and it's the biggest problem that we are ignorant of and that we don't know um, that we actually do is that we don't uh, at first glance want to accept who we are. And maybe that sounds really funny, but in a sense, just that little example when I told you when I was like 11 or 12, like I had no idea about the world and like tons of stuff, but like you want other people to accept something that many times is not true in reality. And you want to give someone that idea of you or that person, wow, someone super extraordinary, someone really cool, someone really awesome to hang out with. And we subconsciously, we make up extra parts of ourselves um, to make ourselves look better. And many times we don't even do that um, really knowingly and consciously, but it just happens naturally because we're trying to cover up things that don't want really to look good in our lives or things that could be made better. So the first thing about having a real mature self image of understanding who I am is accepting that this is the way I am. This is the way God created me. Uh, this is how I was formed in society and being okay with that because everybody has problems and everybody has negative aspects in their life where we really don't want other people to see about us. But that's okay because no one's perfect. And we're going to go and talk about that a little bit more. But also the second thing is we need to accept it as coming from God's hand. Everything in our life comes through God's hands. It's from his divine goodness that he wants you to be who you are. And you maybe sometimes think about yourself and you say, well, I hate this about me. I hate this about me. I wish I could really do this better. But who's that for us to decide? God allowed us to be who are, uh, to be who we am, to, to be created, to, to flourish, and to be the person that I am today. Everything has come from His hands, and I need to have that light of faith saying, okay, it, I don't need to be angry or to be resentful or to be sad that I'm not somebody else or I'm not what I want to be. Because in the reality and underneath all of that is those things that we, that we see in ourselves that we want to change, those are actually the means or the instruments for us to grow in holiness. So if I see that I'm not really intelligent, that I'm, I really struggle in, in school and I don't really meet the expectations of like my older brother or my older sister who always had great grades and I'm like not that and my parents sometimes like comment those things. That's not something for me to be sad at and say, wow, my whole life's ruined. <laughs> I mean, I'm not, I'm not great like my brother or my sister, but to realize, okay, that means that God wants me to actually work harder um, in learning and studying and pushing myself in patience and becoming uh, humble, receiving maybe those humiliations, like maybe I'm not that great like the other person, but who cares? I am probably better at other things than my brother or my sister. But we can't look at that in the sense of always comparing ourselves because it's also not charitable. We're not showing that I love that person when I'm always saying, who's better? Am I better or, or are they better? In God's eyes, that doesn't matter. And what do we live for? We live for God's expectation. We live how God views me. So if God didn't want me to be super intelligent like my brother or my sister or my best friend, then I want to accept that because if God thought that was good for me, then I also want that. So those are two aspects that we really need to think about, like that need to be our basis of understanding what does it mean to be a mature person and how I'm viewed by other people is being okay with myself and seeing that God loves me for exactly who I am. So in the first part of our talk, we need to have a realistic image of myself. So again, coming back to a realistic, what am I like in reality? Not what like I imagine myself to be or what does my Facebook say I'm like or my Instagram posts. It's no, exactly 
being honest of who I am and living in the truth of that. So first off, I really need, need to know what is my temperament. Um, I think I mentioned last year a little bit about our temperaments and the four main ones, but there's also other books and um, uh, you could say articles that are written about this. But if you're asking yourself what, what is a temperament, it's, it's, um, it does not mean your personality. It influences your personality, but it's the way that I react to to uh, how do you say like um, to other situations or to other people uh, for example um, when I was driving one time I don't um, remember what like back in college and I was driving and right next to me there was a guy and for some reason he just started screaming like a lunatic and I realized it's because we're standing in front of a, a red light so we're waiting in line but he really had to be somewhere and he began in his road rage um, an explosion and started yelling and screaming and beeping his horn and obviously nobody can change the red light in, in themselves they were just sitting in that car but I remember when I saw that I remember my my first reaction is I was affected by it I became really tense really scared and very like frantic because for some reason I thought this guy was going to come out of his car and attack me but then you have, uh, I was sitting next to like my sister or my brother, I don't remember who, but it was one of my family members and they didn't react like I did. They were like, oh my gosh, what is wrong with him? But really tranquil and really phlegmatic. So you can see like that's a, like, a, a, like a concrete example. What is your person? Like, how am I affected by actions of other people? Um, am I quick to react? Are my, am I slow to react? And then after that situation passes, how do I process that? For me, I remember it was a very, a very strong impression. So I always remember that. And whenever um, I'm in the car driving and if I see or hear anyone exploding in that same manner, I remember that first time when I was really startled. But then my brother or my sister, I don't remember, they don't remember it at all. Because it, it came as a first impression. Maybe they didn't really they weren't uh they didn't uh, react very strongly to it but then after that too they even forgot about it so uh, pers our temperaments are the way um how do i also act with other people and it's how do i respond um when other people act so it's actually a really good way to know what's my pe temperament like am i melancholic Am I choleric? Am I sanguine? Or am I phlegmatic? And each of them, which is really good, you have strengths and your weaknesses. Like what are the really good things about um, having that temperament? Maybe you could be really active. You could be always wanting to, to, to work and do stuff and to give yourself. Um, there's other people who are more like introvert, so they're better in um, like having a task and working on it constantly, like every single day, really faithfully, like always doing it. There's some people who begin reading a book and then they just get bored and they just can't read it anymore. So you have like these different like inclinations of how do I process and how do I act within the world today and with other people. So having a good understanding of what's my temperament like and understanding the defects that come with that temperament that's a really good way for me to form my self image, to be showing who I am like every day and like having that realistic uh, image. Okay. The second, we need to know one's dominant defect. So that means making the examination, examination of conscience and really understanding what is that thing or what is that sin or that inclination that is like always at the bottom of like all my bad actions and um, also father fuentes who wrote this book that i'm commenting on he also wrote um, a small brief uh, like book as well on the examination of conscience and trying to understand what's that sin or what's that bad thing that i i always do and it's that reason that's always at the bottom of my, all my other like bad actions it can be for pride it can be for vanity it can be for like being really lazy um, because if we look at all of our sins, like when you, when you make a good confession, when you really try to think, okay, why did I do that? Why did I fall into that sin? And if you look at every sin that you do, like really asking for God's light to illuminate you and understanding the reason why, 
um, you can see that there is like a trait. There's a string like connected to all of those sins and they come to one. And obviously all of our sins come from pride, but then through pride, there's like the seven capital sins. And that's where one of my, like all my sins, they can all hone into that one capital sin. So when you learn about your dominant uh, defect or like your dominant sin, like what am I always inclined to do? That's going to help us realize to, to, to fix it, right? So I don't fall into that at the same time and to be aware of it. Because I think that's probably the biggest reason why all of us were not saints now or we're not saints as fast as we could because we don't ask ourselves, why did I fall? Why did I commit that sin again and again? Why didn't I learn? And it's because we don't take the time to, to ask ourselves that question. And what does that do? It keeps us dumb. It keeps us oblivious to what is actually hurting me, what is actually making me fall every single day. So to make that great self image and have a correct ideal uh, idea of who I am, I need to know what is that sin or what is that thing that always makes me fall? Like what am I always falling into? Because when I know that I can correct it, but we have to make that step forward through lots of prayer, discernment, and talking to our spiritual director, if you have one or somebody that you feel uh, confident and um, very free to speak with and asking them for that help. So now I wanna move on to our third, uh, third aspect. In order to have a realistic image of ourselves, we need to know the problems we have and their causes. So the problems we have, they can be internal or external. And in dealing with our self image, a lot of those problems are internal. And some examples are those is like, we have interior conflicts with ourselves. We have isolation problems. Maybe we could be excessively like fearful of something. Uh, these things really do, um, how do you say, uh, they really do like affect of how I portray myself and how, how I want other people to think of me. So in these problems as well, they can also have like their root or like where are they coming from in our past and especially in our childhood. Uh, like an example of this, I remember there was a girl I was talking to and um, she was incredibly, incredibly fe had a fear of drowning, of being in the water. Like if she couldn't see the bottom, she wouldn't go any further. But it was getting to the point where um, it, was, it wasn't just like a fear of water, but it was... I'm, if I can't see it, I don't want to touch it. Like I can't go anywhere further if I can't see it. And the reason was actually through with talking with her parents afterwards, because obviously her parents, when she was growing up, she could, they could see that problem. But when to help her out, they told her that when she was a baby, she had actually gotten swept out um, with a wave in, in the ocean and it had taken her out into the water. And until they had realized what was happening, she was like half, half dead, like drowning and floating in the water. She was like only like maybe two years old, maybe one or two. Um, so then obviously they had to go save her. But that experience, obviously she had no idea of that, no recollection. But as a baby, she had that uh, traumatizing or a traumatizing effect on her that lasted in her conscience and in her, in her psychic. Uh, until she was older. So then when she had realized that she had, a, when she was told that she had that problem, then she was able to understand, okay, it's okay. Like I can overcome this. And obviously she's still scared of the water and that's no problem because it's something that was so rooted in her, but she had absolutely no idea that it had passed to her, that that had to come. So either, war, either way, it's a good um, opportunity to realize, okay, I've got problems and this is, was the cause but now I can fix it. So then we can go to our fourth um, aspect to have a realistic image of ourselves is we need to have humility. So having the virtue of humility helps me accept calmly um, the defects when um, they're pointed out to me by somebody else. And I think I mentioned that before, like when we're talking with your spiritual director or you're talking to that person that you have uh, confidence with about those things that really affect you. If I don't have humility to accept what they're telling me to, I will become oblivious to the sins and the sicknesses that are hurting me, but especially my soul. And the last thing about having humility is that an immature person, when they don't have humility, 
if like, they mess up in a way or if, um, if someone corrects them, what do, they, what do they do? What do they react? They become absolutely super angry, really irritable, and they don't really want to hang out with that person who corrected them because they want to avoid that, um, that touch of reality, that truth, because we don't want to see, because uh, we're dim damaged from original sin, we don't want to see, hey, you know what? You're not really doing great in that aspect. And it really stings our pride when someone tells us that. It's first off really difficult for us to accept it and to realize it, but it's more difficult when someone puts their finger right in our wound and says, oh yeah, you're not really, really great at that. That really hurts. But that's a way for us as well to grow in our sanctity and to be humble and to say, you know what? That person is actually right. And why should I be angry and offended that they're telling me that? I should actually be grateful because they're showing me something that maybe I was unaware of. So we really need to have that idea and to pray for the grace, to be humble, to accept uh, what our spiritual director or what our, our parents or uh, that, that person of confidence tells us because they're not looking out to, to like put their finger in our wound and to make it bigger, but they're trying to seek what is the best for you and to help you correct it because they see that that aspect in your life is really hurting you. So there's many things that, um, that we need to accept in our present and our past. And one of the first things are those positive experiences that we have had in our life. That could be coming from like a good family, like having both parents, a mom and a dad, uh, having a family coming from a good culture. Like if your parents had a good jobs and they were able to support you in maybe the talents or the musical abilities that you have, like going to sport clubs or going to like your piano lessons, like having the opportunity to help you grow in the gifts that you have. But in the sense, we also need to remember that I need to always be grateful for those experiences and not to become prideful that I was able to have those, um, those, those gifts or those blessings and that someone else didn't and to like be negative towards them and to have like a very, like, um, like I'm a very superior person. And if you didn't have that, then you're lower than me. That's not, that's not really a cherry one. That's how that God is calling us to be, to do, but to accept and to be grateful for those positive experiences that we had. The second one is, are the negative experiences. So we mentioned in the positive experiences, that's having like, like a mom and a dad and your whole family. But the negative experiences, like maybe one of your parents have died, maybe they've gotten into a divorce, maybe one of your family members, like your mom or dad has to work overseas or in a different country uh, to get money. And those things, they do have an effect on us because they're not the norm. That's not what normally is supposed to happen. Right when God created us, and we can even see, like in our psychic, in our, in like our nature, we are made to have mom and dad and family because it's the, the unity, and it gives us the confidence of who I am. But when part of that is taken away or broken completely, that does affect me. And our world today wants to tell you, like, no, it's no problem, it's okay, you can be normal, and obviously you are normal. But we also need to expect, and to realize that. It's breaking outside of the norm that God created us to. So it will have effects on me, whether I want it or not, because that's also natural. If you break from God's normal plan, you're going to have consequences. But for us, we need to realize what we talked about in the first part is I need to have humility of recognizing that this negative experience happened in my life and I can't deny it. It is what it is and I need to accept it. The last one is some of, some of us also might have uh, traumatic experiences. So this can be verbal or sexual abuse. It could be having domestic violence in your family. Um, it could be like through the family situation, like if parents had died or if our parents had given us neglect, we were put into foster care. Um, it could be being a victim of an abortion attempt or the person who pushed or had an abortion. These are traumatic experiences that are not a part of God's plan and they have a lot um, a lot of consequences and their wounds are much deeper and an example of this is uh, I remember last year we were we had gotten the news that there was a girl in, in England uh, only 10 years old and it was around Christmas time 
And she uh, had always felt that her mom didn't want her and that she was unloved and like maybe her mom had said things to her, but it's like a long time. And I think her mom had even told her like, I would, you were like a world mistake, like I didn't even want to have you. Like in this point of the time, it was just her and her mom, like there was no dad in the picture. And the little girl who was like only 10 had felt that for so many years. And during, right before Christmas time, she had wrote a, a letter to her mom saying, I'm sorry that I was, I was born. I'm sorry that I was like a baggage for you. And my Christmas gift to you is that I won't exist anymore. And she had written this in a card and put it in the Christmas tree. And then her mom had found her and she had hung herself in her bedroom. If we have those traumatic experiences, we need to process them through God's grace, through professional help and forgive those people who have hurt us but also forgive ourselves if we have done something that has affected a person traumatically. Therefore, we must convert the bad experiences into good and live them in a non-traumatic way. So like I said, there are opportunities for us to forgive other people and to move forward. Because if I don't forgive and if I don't go past that, that wound will constantly stay with me my entire life and it's always gonna be digging at the same wound and what happens when you touch um, like a wound or a cut many times, it begins to get really red, but then if you continue touching it, then it becomes bigger and then it can become infected until into the worst cases, if you keep touching it, you might need to amputate it. You know, you amputate that limb or that leg that you had because it's no more, you can't use it anymore. It cannot heal. But in the same way that happens with us, with us in the soul. If I don't allow somebody to help heal that wound and if I keep touching it and don't let anybody else, that will ultimately lead me to killing my soul and cutting myself off from God's grace. So therefore, when if we don't process these traumatic, um, these traumatic experiences, we also can have aggression and uh, like aggressive outbursts outbursts on myself, on other people, and many times also against God. Um, against myself, that is when we see that people um, struggle with bulimia, uh, anorexia, masturbation, uh, cutting, or having other forms of abuse, um, this self-depression, this anxiety attacks. Those are, um, how you can say, um, effects of these wounds that have been caused in my soul and they are effects and uh, like outbursts that I have control over my body and that I'm showing what is going on in my soul, which is turmoil, which is confusion, which is uh, ultimately pain, what is happening. You can also have this uh, aggressive outburst against other people. That can be division in my families, tons of bickering, tons of complaints. It can be resentment. It can be neglect, um, lots of division within the family. Uh, if you've ever like been around a person who like always complains, everything they do is just complaining and super negative. It's because they have something that's going on in their soul that they're not able to overcome. So we can also go against other people um, when we're like treating and when we feel those things in our soul. Or thirdly, we can act aggressively against God in the sense of doubting God's paternity, that he's a loving father, uh, rejecting like moral and religious beliefs. And ultimately we can end up losing our faith and accusing God uh, why he allowed those things to happen to me that have traumatized me and the wounds that I have. I think you can really, it's very easy to see, but like how many people in the world who have declared themselves atheists or agnostics or um, just saying like, I just don't even believe in God. Because many, if you look, many of them have had traumatic experiences. Um, where they have blamed God for the bad things that they've had. And because of those bad uh, experiences, they said, well, then God doesn't exist. He's not there anymore. Um, and this is a very erroneous um, like thought of thinking that, that God has punished me. And if I have experienced this, it's because that, you know what, he's not there. So you know what, to punish him, I'm not going to believe in him. I'm going to do what I want. And that's not uh, helpful to our soul and doesn't heal the problems that we have but it's actually the exact opposite. That's why we need to go more towards God to find his grace and to find his healing in, in our souls and in, in the wounds that we have caused other people. 
If you remember in the beginning, we talked about accepting our self-image and our personality as a, a gift from God. But also in that acceptance of self, we also need to have acceptance of our family. So we can see that signs of an immature person is being ashamed of one's race, place of birth, family poverty, a last name, lack of studies or culture. And when we see that those signs in an immature person, those are actually like um, demonstrating like that person feels inferior and like they feel like, um, like I'm not good enough in society and because of my family, I became like this. And we can see that when they, when they do that, that's when like lying or duplicity comes in of like exaggerating uh, where I've come from and imagining. And this is like, if we continue doing this, we can end up like living like a double life. Like when I'm with my family, I'm one person, but that when I'm with my friends or when I go off to college and nobody knows me from beforehand or nobody knows my family, I begin to create and imagine um, things that are not real in reality. And it's because I don't accept my family of who they are. But when I accept my family that, okay, maybe I can't change, um, where they studied or why don't they have a better job or maybe the things, bad things that they've done in their life, that doesn't mean that I don't love them. But when I accept them, that shows so much more charity, but it also gives you that freedom to say, yeah, well, you know, my brother or my sister or my dad or my mom, like they did so and so, but I'm not affected by that in that bad way. I'm not known for my mom's actions or my dad's actions, but having that mature and confidence um, in myself that shows other people as well that I, I'm in control like I don't I'm not subjected to the actions of other people that I'm free because I have confidence in who I am I have confidence that God has loved me and I'm able to be uh, freer and showing charity and that and virtue to those other people as well so then we move on to the third aspect so acceptance of one's limitations and failures so therefore, it's important to use well what we have to the best of our ability. So this could be like our talents or the abilities that we have been able to have and that we've developed within our lives. And we can see that clearly in um, what was written in sacred scripture when God has given the talent, uh, one talent to one person, five talents to another, and ten talents to another. And we see like how each of those um, persons, how each of those people, how they, what they did with the, the gifts or the talents that God had given them. And we saw that, that, uh, the five had doubled and the 10 had doubled, but the one who just had one little one didn't even try to make more good use of it, but became discouraged <laughs> in the sense, like seeing the many gifts of other people and said, I'm not going to do anything. I'll just hold on to it. And I won't develop it in that way. And then we saw that, uh, that God then afterwards like reprimanded him saying, even though I gave you that one, because I gave it to you, it had worth and it had value. So when we see that maybe I don't have the best qualities or tons of gifts, that doesn't mean that I'm worthless. It means that God has wanted me to take care of this one or this two or this third aspect of my life to take care of it, to embellish it and to show that I'm grateful for what he's given me. But when I become, um, I would say very like depressive and I become very resentful of the little that I have that actually shows God that I actually don't love you and I don't care for what you give me because I think I know better and you should have given me more. And this aspect and this attitude, when we do this to God and to other people that creates for us this incredible discontentment within our life, we see that many times like, some people who have lots of gifts and lots of talents, they can be used in a good or a bad way. But those who use it in a good way, they're incredibly happy because they're using what God has given them and they recognize that maybe I'm undeserving of this. God has, could have given this gift to somebody else or these talents to somebody else, but he's chosen to give them to me. And he's given to me with a responsibility to use them for his glory and to help other people as well. But then we can see in the bad way that people can become very uh, prideful of what they have and that it actually becomes their downfall and it's not a useful tool for their salvation, but it can be a way of going down the wrong road. So then we also see that there are characteristics of an immature person. 
So when a person, an immature person, when they see that they have failed or if they haven't done something right or somebody else discovers uh, like their faults, they can react really aggressively and actually try to throw the blame on other people. So we can see that when we uh, fall into different defects or we make mistakes in our life, uh, we need to ask for the grace to be mature and to be responsible of taking that responsibility on us and saying, you know what? Well, this time it just didn't work out the way I wanted to, but it was my problem and it's not the end of the world. Like I can move on. And maybe I was humiliated in that, in that moment, but it was just a moment. No one's going to remember it. So many more people will probably remember when you react badly than if you react well, if you just accepted the humili humiliation with a good spirit. Also having a mature self image of myself also means having a sense of humor and being able to laugh at oneself and with oneself. So we do ridiculous stuff and an immature person, they would become incredibly humiliated, uh, absolutely distressed onto where that actually affects them in their soul and where they can um, be able to move past uh, that ridiculous experience. But we can see like uh, a sign of like a, a mature person who understands who they am uh, is able to laugh at themselves. I remember a really funny game that when a sister and I, we were religious sisters, we had gone to the, um, the grocery store to buy some stuff and we had met one of the, um, one of our friends, like one of the parishioners in, in like the parking lot. So we had like the food in our hands. So we went to go put it into our car and when I opened, when, um, she went, I think first she went and opened the door and went to throw like the bread or whatever into the car. And she realized like, Oh, like our car seats are gone. Like the seats in the car are gone. And she looked around and she realized it wasn't uh, our car. <laughs> and then she realized that the man was also in the front seat. So then she like, like shut the door and she's like, I'm sorry. And then she left and we were talking. And then I had still, I was talking to the lady while she was trying to put the, our food in our car. But then, uh, so then she put the food in our car and she returned back. And then I had a whole bunch of food in my hand. So I also went to go put the food in the car and I did the exact same thing. <laughs> I went to open the door, uh, like cause I was driving. So I went to open the driver's seat and I saw the man in the car. <laughs> and so then I said, it's like, sorry again. And then we just began laughing about it, uh, laughing at it because we thought, we do ridiculous stuff all the time. And those things are really humiliating that we both went to the exact same car thinking it was our own car. And, but the man was there. That was like the funniest part. So we can realize like when those things happen, it's okay. You can laugh about it because it's funny and it's ridiculous. And why should that be a moment to where I die of embarrassment? You know, but we can see like an immature person in, in different aspects. They, they, they want, they don't want other people to see uh, that they have failed or they've been humiliated. Um, also, we also can see that there's the really bad aspect of humor in the sense of having sarcastic humor and um, having that sarcastic, um, spirit and making these jokes. But at the end and what's at the bottom of sarcasm is cutting down other people, making a joke and saying, ha it's like no problem. But we can also see like, that's not a good sense of humor, but it's actually an excuse they, they can use to have liberty of saying whatever and whenever they want, but putting it under the text of I'm just joking. I didn't mean it. Like don't take it seriously. But we see that that is not a mature sense of humor. And it's actually um, a way of that pride coming out and saying, I don't need to be laughed upon, but I can laugh at other people. So it's like that rule uh, of sarcasm. I have the right to laugh at other people, but if anybody laughs at me, you're going to get it. So we need to see and have a good uh, balance of being able to laugh at oneself, even if it's something ridiculous or if we got really humiliated, that it's no problem. And the more that I put like uh, thought into it, um, that's more damage that's going to be for me. We just need to realize that everybody does ridiculous stuff and we just need to get through it and just get over it and have a good laugh at it. So another aspect is tolerating our frustrations and our failures. So we all fail at something and no one is perfect. So we shouldn't be surprised when we fail. Many times it hurts and sometimes it hurts really bad, but those failures and the frustrations actually form part of our history and they form uh, who we are. 
um, and they form of how, how am I going to react like that in the future? So these are always opportunities for God showing us to grow in virtue, grow, have, helping us to grow in patience. And ultimately it's for our good when we don't always get everything that we want because it shows us that I am limited and I am not invincible. And I really do depend um, on other people and I depend ultimately on God. But if I have his grace and if I, ha I know that he loves me, then what else is there to worry about really in the end of all this? It doesn't matter if I have all these great gifts or these talents or, or I get the grade that I wanted or I like, please my parents or like, I have lots of friends. I mean, those things are important, but they're not the end of this life. The end of our, our life is loving and serving and knowing that God loves me and that he is happy with who I am. And I actually do him a great offense when I become ungrateful and I don't, um, and I don't accept with, with humility the things that he has given me. So in this, when living out our, having a good self image, we need to think of these different aspects as well. Um, that, that I'm not confined and I'm not uh, stunted by um, the reactions of other people or by the actions of other people, but that freedom of being who I am actually comes from within and it comes and is very intimately connected with how I view God and how um, that I receive everything that comes um, from, from the, everything that I experience in life comes from his hands. And I don't need to allow these failures and the bad things that have happened to me, um, like sway me or, or form me in a down, in a bad road. If you can remember, uh, just the last word that I'll give you is remember in Romans, um, 8, 28, that all things work for good for those who love God and who are called according to his purpose. So when we have the light of faith and we know that God loves us, we can see that everything in my life, whether good, bad, traumatic, or whatever, it's because God wants that for me because he sees that's going to make me holier through the good experiences and through the bad experiences. And when we realize that, that gives us this huge freedom of spirit to live and to be happy and not care. Like if I fail at something or if I become humiliated or someone else sees that, that uh, like I have these defects, it doesn't confine me. It doesn't trap me inside of a box um, of what I want other people to see me. But knowing that God loves me, accepts me for who I am, that allows me to live my life completely um, in a more free and a more charitable and more happy way. So I want to take the time again to thank you for listening to these videos and participating in the youth day and the way you can. Um, so we'll hopefully we'll see you next year and just know that the sisters and priests are always praying for you, always asking God for the grace um, of enlightenment for each one of you, that you'll be able to know what is God calling me to do uh, here and now in this day and how I can live um, my personality and who I am and in a free and in a very natural way, according to God's plan and how he has made me. So I thank you again for your, your time and, and let's end with a prayer. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, a world without end, amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. See you guys next year.